Paul, you ready? Ready now. Okay, Paul. Um, I want to welcome everyone, welcome everyone to um, the Quality of Life Committee. Um, this is our first meeting of the new council, and I'm excited to help facilitate these discussions and tackle the real issues that affect quality of life. We're going to focus on everything from affordable housing to our unhomed population to COVID-19, um, illegal dumping, which we talked about in the prior meeting, short-term rentals, infrastructure, and everything in between. Um, and so while we might cross over into other committees, the ultimate goal here is to improve everyone's quality of life. And I'm excited to work with all of the district council members in this committee because I know that we are all uh, focused on improving quality of life for our citizens in New Orleans. Um, with that, Paul, can you please call the roll? We'll call council member Harris, chair, present. Council member Jeruso. Here. Present. Council member Thomas. Here. Council member Green. I think he's connecting. Councilmember Green is connecting. Uh, Councilmember King. Okay, we have at least three, likely four members. We have. Thanks, Paul. Paul, can you read the agenda, please? Yes. Apologies. They are moving the dumpster outside my window. Um, the agenda for the January twenty seventh Quality of Life Committee meeting is as follows: Item one, roll call. Two, approval of the minutes from the June 17th, 2021 meeting. Three, COVID-19 updates. A presentation on the current COVID-19 infection and vaccination information. Presenter, Dr. Jennifer Avegno, Director of the New Orleans Health Department. Four, homeless initiatives. A presentation on current homeless initiatives and outreach procedures. Presenters, Jennifer Avegno, MD, Director of the New Orleans Health Department. Margiana Wil Willman, Director of the Office of Housing Policy and Community Development. Martha Cagle, Executive Director of Unity of Greater New Orleans. Angela Patterson, Deputy Director of Unity of Greater New Orleans. Item five, community cleanup efforts. A text amendment to create a new use category of convenience centers or waste and recycling drop-off centers to consider the addition of such to the use tables in all appropriate zoning districts and to establish site design and use standards. The purpose of the new use category is to curb illegal dumping and enhance hurricane debris collection. Presenters, Matt Torrey, Director of Department of Sanitation, Jonathan Wisby, Chief Technology Officer for the City of New Orleans, Paul Kramer, Planning Administrator for the City Planning Commission. Item six is adjournment. Thanks, Paul. Um, I don't see Dr. Vegno on this call. I'm just trying to make sure she's here for the first agenda item. Five minutes. Oh, she apparently needs five minutes to join um, I wonder if we couldn't take the illegal dumping agenda item if everyone is here for that. I see Jonathan Wisby. I think Matt Torrey may be running a little behind, but I'm uh, happy to present in his stead. And, and like you said, Mr. Kramer is here from the city planning. Why don't we go ahead so we're not holding everybody up and talk about uh, the cleanup stations. Absolutely. Um, Paul, I, I think I'm unable to share the presentation from my permissions, if, if that's something you are able to enable. All right, I just got it. Thank you. Um, so we are here today to discuss um, the zoning tax amendment before the council referred by the City Planning Commission. But before we got into that, I really wanted to give uh, this committee in particular, a little look at the history that led up to this particular request so you can understand it in its full context. Um, and the, really the core of this is to start with the Cleanup Knoll Initiative, which was launched by the mayor in 2018. Um, and there's really four pillars that we are, um, are putting at the core of this initiative. The first is to eliminate. Um, we have you know, discovered a number of backlogs, particularly in quality of life issues. And so, you know, the former council was uh, very gracious in uh, allocating us a significant sum of money um, last year through the American uh, Recovery Plan Act uh, to eliminate a lot of that backlog of illegal dumping cases. In the month of December, we cleared over 2,000 illegal dumping cases with that funding. Um, and that's a thing that we're continuing to look at what the sustainable solution is for being able to remove that on an ongoing basis in a way that isn't 
uh, overly cost consuming. Um, the second pillar, which is really what we're talking about here today is, is about enhancing. It's about giving people more options, not just saying, okay, well, we need you to, um, uh, to, to stop uh, putting trash outside of the, the certain receptacles, but to say, we wanna help you and be a partner with you in this effort. We wanna make sure that we're giving you all the, all the uh, assets that you need and resources you need in order to uh, live uh, in a clean community and, and to ensure that everything uh, is uh, clear of, of illegal dumping and such. Um, the third pillar uh, is about enforcement, doing a better job as a city municipal entity uh, of enforcing the laws that are already on the books. Uh, particularly in quality of life issues. Uh, and then the fourth uh, pillar is on education, is really about building those social norms uh, for a clean, clean community and ensuring that everyone treats the community and the neighborhoods that they live in with the respect uh, that they, they would wanna see in their own neighborhood. Um, so just to kind of talk a little bit about this particular uh, zoning amendment, uh, one of the real big issues facing uh, city residents at this point when it comes to legal dumping is that there just aren't a lot of good public options for what to do with your trash outside of your weekly pickups uh, at curbside. Um, you know, there's really no place that you can go to uh, dispose of bulk trash if you're renovating something, if you're trying to get rid of some white goods, there are opportunities to leave it at your dumpster. Um, but if you're having a big event like a crawfish boil at your house or something that may not have special event permits and the associated, but just as a family gathering that produces a significant amount of volume of trash, there's really not a lot of good options to go get rid of that trash outside of your curbside. Um, so what we would li really like to do is put in place um, a resource that's available really in many communities throughout this country. Uh, we'll, we'll show you a little bit later where how Jefferson Parish has particularly handled this issue, but really a publicly run um, center where somebody can go and drop off their residential waste, some slight commercial waste, and not have to rely upon a garbage or junk hauler in order to do that. Uh, certainly we have a lot of, I think, reputable garbage and junk haulers in this city that follow regulations on where they um, should be dumping that waste that they're picking up from customers. But unfortunately, we also do have some that, you know, use as part of their business model, illegal dumping to, you know, dispose of waste that they're being paid um, to, to dispose of. And so I think giving people this option where they can go and dispose of it themselves and not have to rely on a third party distributor and hope that that person is dealing responsibly with the waste is the reason we're proposing this particular use. Um, when we first started to look at this, we realized that the way the zoning code was set up, the only real applicable use for this was something called waste transfer stations, which it was clear were originally constructed as a use in the zoning code in order to really handle industrial size commercial waste hauling companies and their need for a central location to dump their hauls on the way to uh, a landfill. Um, what we really are proposing here is a much lighter use, something that you and your car or your pickup truck could just go up to with a few bags of trash and be able to dispose of it there. Um, and so it has a, a much smaller impact on their surrounding area. Uh, and whereas waste transfer stations are zoned as only industrial, convenience centers as a different use category would be zoned to be able to take place in commercially zoned areas. Um, this text amendment was one developed, uh, like I said, in the City Planning Commission. We have Mr. Paul Kramer on the phone from the CPC uh, if there are specific questions about that process. But that text amendment was uh, passed in December, uh, and that's what routes it to the council today for our discussion. Uh, to go a little bit more into uh, exactly what a convenience center looks like, uh, they are only going to be allowed to operate on either city-owned land or through a city contract with an entity. Um, they're going to offer generally free disposal of waste. Uh, we do have plans to possibly come up with a nominal cost fee structure for particularly commercial businesses that start using the site and that want to be able to dump some of their waste there, not waste hauling businesses, but you know your normal small business contractor or something of that nature. We want to be able to accommodate them in a way that also acknowledges that they're making you know, money off of the business that's that's generating that that waste for disposal. Um, and so we were really looking at areas that are commercial that may, you know, the, the ordinance currently requires them to not be um, abutting residential zoned land. Uh, so we're not talking about putting this in, you know, in neighborhoods or anything like that, but in commercial areas where there may be a little bit of a lighter use uh, than the pure industrial areas, which are pretty limited in the city. Jonathan, can I ask a question on the last slide, last bullet point? Uh, when you say commercially zoned areas, are those fully commercially zoned areas or they include mixed use areas too? 
Uh, I'm actually asked Paul to clarify that. I think I know the answer, but you always go to expert when you're not. I, I, I understand. I should have asked Paul. I apologize for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Council Member. That uh, the recommendation is purely commercial districts, so C1, C2, and C3 districts, and then also uh, the all the industrial districts, all four of the industrial districts, and another district that we call that is called general plan development, which is a lot of formerly industrial uh, sites, including one uh, that is owned by the city that I think would be one of the first uh, sites to be open. Thanks, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, and so in terms of sort of what the plan would be for these sites, uh, I do wanna emphasize that, you know, we haven't conducted final site selection. And in some of these areas, we are encountering issues when using solely currently owned city land. Uh, and so this is something we do want to discuss with the council and get the council's impact, particularly the district council person's uh, impact. Uh, so you can kind of see the red dots on this map are Jefferson Parish waste drop off point locations. And you can see how they've made a real effort to kind of structure those geographically dispersed among their area. And, you know, it's a rule of thumb, but I would say in general, none of them are more than a 20 minute drive from somewhere else in Jefferson Parish. And that's the kind of standard I think that we want to create as well is that if you are a resident of New Orleans, you shouldn't have to drive more than 20 minutes to get to your local convenience center. Um, you know, and so that, for our perspective, would mean something, uh, a convenience center located in New Orleans East, a convenience center located on the West Bank, and then one somewhere centrally located on the East Bank. Uh, I'll say that, you know, as Paul has mentioned, you know, we have identified a city-owned site that we think uh, is authorized by this particular uh, text amendment and that we think is appropriate for it at the former uh, incinerator site on Old Gentilly in New Orleans East. We have not yet identified uh, sites of that nature that are city owned on the East Bank or West Bank. And that's something where I think we're gonna to have to work a little bit with your offices to make sure that we understand the best places to put these in an area that is not disruptive of residential character, um, but is on either land that the city could potentially acquire or could lease uh, from an entity that would be operating the contract if, if that's the way we wanna go. So uh, these are not determined locations at this point. There's plenty of opportunity for you all to provide input and we welcome that input. Uh, but we do think it's really important to keep that geographical um, uh, locate uh, general geographical location so that we can make sure that people don't have to drive onerous amounts because if you put it too far from people, they're just not going to use it and it won't have its intended impact. Uh, so in terms of next steps, like I said, the first one is really, you know, if the council should grant this particular um, change to the zoning ordinance, uh, we will uh, start though that sort of direct meeting with the council members, meeting with local neighborhood groups, and we'll be working on trying to solidify particularly those two sites for the West Bank and the East Bank. Uh, and then I think we'll be moving forward uh, with that East site, uh, with, along with the collaboration, obviously, with council member Thomas and, and others uh, to make sure that that fits within everyone's broad uh, vision for that site. But I think in our perspective, it, it is a very attractive site for use for this because it was formerly industrial used. Um, as a former incinerator site, it's already city owned, it's zoned properly for this use. And so it's something that we think with, you know, some additional improvements made to the site, we could transmit it, transfer form it into a convenience center in relatively short um, order. Uh, and then, you know, obviously as those sites are developed, we'd be working with our capital projects administration to conduct those site improvements. And we'd be issuing an RFP because we envision these sites to be operated by a contractor rather than directly by city employees. So that's sort of where we are, what brought us here today, what we're trying to accomplish, and what we see as some of the key next steps uh, should the council move forward with this particular uh, ordinance. Um, and we certainly welcome any input uh, or, or thoughts that the council has. Uh, and we're also willing to answer any questions you might have about the process that got us here or what we're looking to do uh, in next steps. Thank you, Jonathan and Paul. Uh, council members, do you have any questions? Council member Thomas. No, thank, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, thank you. These proposed sites, when you, when you look at the history of these sites, are these, and do any of these sites represent sites that residents or people petitioned to have closed uh, some time ago? Uh, Especially the one in the East. 
So uh, for the incinerator site in the east, uh, the reality is, council member, I, I don't know the full comprehensive history of it, so I, I can't uh, comprehensively tell you one way or the other. Can we check into that? Can we check to see what the history uh, is? Absolutely, we, we can Does check into that. Comment, yeah, and we'll get back to your office with the outcome of that. Thank you. Thank you. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member King. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Guys, I feel like y'all's on a campaign trail with me because this is something that I I promise to to look into and, and get it and get accomplished while on the campaign trail. So I'm very excited to see this has happened. This is very much needed. Um, we have places in Algiers, throughout districts, throughout the city, it looks like a, a, a legal dumping site. So this is something that I believe will, will prevent, prevent that in the future. I do, I already did, I did start looking at some sites um, on the West Bank where one will be uh, located. So I would love to get with your team to give some ideas. My uh, land use person has already looked at the zoning and, and kind of saw with that the neighborhood surrounded to make sure it's not burdensome on the surrounding neighbors. So we do have some ideas. We'd love to present that to you. And also we received some early feedback from our constituents um, um, in the Algiers area about what they think may be the best place to have this site. So I wanna just make sure just to, to put the residents at ease that this is just gonna be like bulk items, sofas, love seats, TVs, we're not talking about, well, you tell me what we're not going to have, but um, you can. Yeah, uh, so certainly, you know, none of the hazardous waste that are, uh, you know, regulated by the state of Louisiana outside of special situations, we would have an authorized state program to do, you know, a one day pickup of certain material, like household cleaners or something like that. Um, you know, you are allowing white, white goods. I know that's a, a big thing for a lot of folks. There's a lot of confusion about how to dispose of white goods. And, and you know, we will be accepting those. Um, you know, we're seeking approval from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality to also be accepting tires at these sites, which is another significant, you know, issue that we see uh, that, you know, has a certain state level of approval, but we don't expect to encounter any issues with that. Um, you know, and then other than that, I think it would be generally what you consider to be household and construction waste uh, of a non-hazardous nature. Uh, and so, you know, it, it is something where, you know, if you were just going to put this there and it was going to sit for days at a time, you know, there could be some fears about, you know, smell in the general area. But I think the requirements that we build into this RFP in this contract would require really regular, you know, there shouldn't be going more than a couple of hours without a trip to the landfill, I think. Um, at the site, and there should be really clear parameters about before you close up for the night, here's what needs to be accomplished in terms of, you know, uh, carrying off the waste that's remaining. And so I think those types of, you know, caution, cautionary requirements will um, dispel maybe many of the, you know, immediate issues that residents might have. But I think the other area is that you, you also put it in an area where it's convenient to people, but it's not disruptive of, of their daily lives as well. And so, you know, our hope is that people will see this as a resource and that when they're not needing to dump anything anywhere, they won't even remember that this is here. Uh, and, you know, that's really the intent that we have. We think that, you know, working with your offices and certainly I think council member, it's great to hear about, you know, already doing that research. And uh, we really do want to talk with you about finding the right appropriate spot in the West Bank where we can do that, where it can have that kind of minimal use. Um, but, you know, we, we don't anticipate there to be any long-term impacts between residents and the sites, as long as we do a good job selecting them. And we think that this particular ordinance really protects uh, a lot of, you know, the potential abuse you could see of locating these sites by requiring them to be city run and, and requiring them to be um, uh, not abutting residentially zoned property. So we think there are a lot of protections in place in the existing ordinance. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the one in Jefferson off of Pelco on wall, and it's, it's done perfectly. And we all know, uh, Crawfish season is coming up, if not already here. So we definitely can dispose of our uh, use our, our old crawfish, our crawfish heads. Let me not be correct. Our crawfish heads at this this place, right? Yes, sir. I can confirm that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So ahead. Thank you, Council Member King. Uh, Council Member Jerusa, please. 
Thank you. Uh, the biggest uh, outside of sort of ordinary sanitation issues we complaint we get is in the university area, um, the area where Tulane Loyola is, and it's sort of the recurring issues that college kids have who are college kids and then also move in, move out. And while I realize the universities have tried um, to help remedy this, it remains an ongoing problem. So, um, you know, I, I would like to look at how we can remedy that as well, because it's sort of a special and unique issue. We have dumping issues. We have, um, you know, people not picking up their litter issues, of course, that we're trying to deal with. But at the same time, in at least District A, this is something that if we can figure out where to put it in an appropriately labeled district near the campuses, I think it would be very much appreciated. So they could they could be directing um, stuff there. Absolutely, and I'll, the other thing I'll say is I think you bring up a great point, Council Member. That you know the one the presupposition on this. Uh, particular initiative is that people will have access to vehicles to in order to transmit this trash to the convenience center. We know that is not true in absolute throughout our community, especially I would imagine much of, you know, the college kids you're talking about, many of them may not have vehicles with them while they're staying on or near campus and rely on, you know, university transportation. And so I think there are still holes that we need to fill that this will not fill by itself. I think what we see this as is a really important first step to really modernizing how this community deals with trash into giving our residents another resource available, but there are still gonna be gaps that we're gonna to need to find, you know, collaborative partnerships and kind of innovative ways and in sometimes, either whether it be partnering with Tulane and other area universities on that type of initiative um, to, you know, have some third party convey their, their waste to this site or to a landfill. Um, yeah, no, no, Jonathan, I agree. I mean, I, I, you're, you make, you, you know, in response to what I said, you make a good point, which is obviously there are a lot of college kids come here, they have a bicycle or they're walking or they're taking public transportation. And so they can't put the sofa on top of a streetcar. Um, but at the same time, if you have a willing partner in Loyola or Tulane or Xavier or Delgado or Dillard or whoever it is, and you can get it to a convenience site, particularly when you know there's been an uptick in activity, I think that's going to be incredibly important. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member Geruso. Um, I know we're time limited on Dr. Vegno, so I'm going to hold my questions for private um, discussion. Um, and also on the public comment, we may be getting public comments on this. We're not going to read it because nothing's up for vote, but I hope that you will circulate any public comment to the council people. So why don't we turn to agenda number three, Jonathan, uh, Paul, thank you so much. Thank you, council. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Vegno. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, Y'all are ready for me now? Ready to go. All right. Um, let me pull up. I'm going to share my screen. And I think we're starting with vaccines. So let me do that really quickly. Um, hold on. Sorry, give me one second. Doc, I can pull up the slides if you need me to. I got it, Paul. All right. Can y'all see that? Okay, great. Looks like you can. Um, well, I appreciate this. I've really, um, I've really valued being able to come and present to council uh, regularly on, oh, wait, wrong one. Sorry. Doing this one next. Um, regularly on COVID. Let's see, there we go. Um, and I appreciate the continued opportunity. So let's just dive dive right in. Uh, so these are yesterday's numbers. I apologize, I have not had a chance to look at our data today. I think this picture <laughs> tells the story. Um, you can see how in terms of cases in Orleans Parish, um, our recent Omicron surge absolutely dwarfs everything else. There is a tremendous amount of viral transmission out there. 
um, continuing to be, although it, it does seem pretty clear we hit our peak about a week or two ago. And um, we're coming down in a bit of a jagged form, but we are coming down. Um, where we are right now, though, would be considered a peak for pretty much any other previous outbreak. So again, we are nowhere near out of the woods. Um, our most recent percent positivity in the city is 13.5%. That is the lowest in the state. And that's a lot of cases and a very high percent positivity on an awful lot of tests. So just to kind of give you a perspective, um, hospitalizations remain high. Oh, shoot, still showing the old one. Hold on, sorry. Let's try this again, I apologize. I'm the health director, not the technology director. Okay. Are you guys seeing the vaccine presentation now? Yes. So we see, yeah, okay. we see your slide. All right. I apologize, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so you should be able to see the, uh, the epi curve now. If you're not, please just let me know. Um, hospitalizations statewide are still quite high. Uh, they have not approached our peak in Delta, which was 3,000, but 2,200 is a lot of people in the hospital with COVID. And that seems to have plateaued a bit. It's not really coming down. And, you know, unfortunately, we still have an awful lot of people in the hospital and people out of people, staff out of the hospital because they are ill with COVID. So our hospitals are still under tremendous pressure. I'm sorry, guys, I don't know why this is, there we go. Um, unfortunately, in the last few days, and this is typical of, of a surge, we've seen a, a, a spike in deaths and deaths are usually a lagging indicator. But I wanna really put in perspective how deadly this epidemic has been in the two years since it began. What you're seeing here are not the total numbers of people who have died, they are the rates per 100,000 residents. So Orleans Parish has about 400,000 residents um, and so our rate is that for every 100,000, we've had 247 die. That brings our total up to close to 1,000 deaths since the, since the pandemic started. This is a way, though, that we can compare parishes and states of different size with each other. Um, and you can look and see these, these numbers are incredibly high. COVID is in the top three causes of death uh, across the board for most of our, our area, including New Orleans, um, you can see that our numbers, although we were the hot spot in deaths early in the pandemic, are actually lower than our neighbors. Um, and I think that's in no small part due to our stricter adherence and stricter mitigation measures. Um, that being said, there, this pandemic is far more deadly than a simple virus or a simple flu. And so we always need to proceed, I think, from that point. Um, you know, the vaccinations for New Orleans have been a real bright spot. Uh, you can see, and these are this is fully vaccinated percentages, not just first doses. You can see that a full two-thirds of Orleans residents have had a full vaccination series that's higher than both Louisiana and the national average. It's far higher for our adult population. 82.7% is a tremendous number of our adults who are fully vaccinated. Um, our, our kids are coming along. Um, you know, as you know, as of February 1st, the school requirement kicks in. So I do anticipate that our pediatric numbers are going to rise significantly in the, the next uh, few weeks. Um, and certainly you can see the effect of having that mandate when you compare us to both the Louisiana and the national rates for kids. Um, we're ahead of the national average for boosters, but what we've really learned with Omicron is that booster is essential to preventing the most severe disease. So 42% is unfortunately not where we wanna be. Um, we know that there are disparities still persisting by age and race. Our seniors are wonderfully vaccinated, and that's because this was a very real pandemic for them. And so they didn't really need a whole lot of convincing. Our young folks, we still have a ways to go. Um, we still see gaps in vaccination rates by race, but those have closed significantly. And if you look at the adult rates, they're closing even faster. And so I'm, I'm happy of the gains we've made there. But again, we know we continue to reach out um, to areas with communities of color to make sure that they're getting the access information that they need to get vaccinated. 
And you all, if you haven't already, will start getting these maps. Um, I want to thank our colleagues at DPW who've been running them for us since the beginning of the pandemic. It helps you just see where which census tracts are more or less vaccinated. The dark green here means that over 60% of the entire tract um, is fully vaccinated. And the light green is, is less than 50% or 60%, excuse me. Um, the little red in the middle is uh, not a real track, so ignore that. This is a whole lot more green than it used to be, but it does highlight the areas we still need to do work. And so much of our outreach areas, whether it's giving tests, whether it's um, supporting vaccine efforts, education outreach, are in those areas that still um, are falling short of the goal that we've set. So in terms of the Omicron variant, where are we now? Um, as you can see from our data, and this is true of the places like New York City, Chicago, that peaked as early as New Orleans, um, you know, we're, we're all on the downslope, which is a, a much better place to be. Hospitalizations, though, in Louisiana and elsewhere are currently plateaued, and there are many states around the country where hospitals are even in worse straits than they ever have been at any point in the pandemic. So everyone is strained. Uh, we are seeing an increase in deaths that comes at the tail end of a particular outbreak, and so that's Everyone is tragic because by and large, they could have been presented. And the rest of Louisiana is still surging in large parts. Uh, we have either the lowest or second lowest case counts, percent positivity um, and all the metrics it, compared to the other 63 parishes. So that still makes us vulnerable as other areas across the state have not hit, hit their peak. So what do we think is critical to continue protecting New Orleans as best as possible? Um, really, it's these layers of mitigation that we talk about. It is widespread masking, particularly in indoor spaces where you don't know who's vaccinated, who's not, who's sick, who's not. Masks stop that transmission or significantly lower the transmission. Um, we are happy about our high vaccination rates, but we really, really need to get boosters up so that we can keep people out of the hospital and prevent the most severe disease and death. It is true that we do have some treatment for COVID-19 that we didn't have before, but I will caution that it's in very short supply. So both Paxlovid, which is an oral um, antiviral that's now on the market, as well as the only now approved monoclonal antibody, so Trovimab, are very, very limited. And there are strict criteria, particularly for monoclonal antibodies that most folks don't meet. So while we're happy to have them and utilizing them to their full capability, these are really not gonna be game changers for the foreseeable future. And then we feel very strongly um, that the vaccine negative test mandate helps put that bubble of protection over the city to prevent those who are unvaccinated and or infectious coming and doing um, lots of activities to further worsen the chain of transmission. What you're seeing around the country is that more and more cities are putting these mandates in place because they recognize that, that they're necessary for the same reason that we do. Um, in terms of mass and tests, the CDC has changed its guidance. It does recommend that at all, if at all possible, individuals choose a medical grade or a surgical KN95, N95 mask. There's a lot of them out there. Um, we've provided many to many different places, um, and so we'll continue to do so. But now is really the time to ditch your cloth mask if you can get another one. Um, At-home tests, the, the uh, ability to access those continues to be a bit challenging. Um, we, we were happy to see the federal government start their program to, uh, to mail them to you, but it, that comes with challenges. You have to have uh, working internet to order them. We've heard of folks in apartment buildings not being able to order them because if one person with that address orders it first, then it kicks it out. So we know this is not a perfect uh, system. Uh, I've got the website up. I also have a phone number for those who don't have internet uh, who want to order their tests. I still recommend everyone do it. They probably won't get here um, until next week. I ordered mine the day they opened and I still haven't seen it yet. Uh, we are trying 
our best to get as many at-home tests as possible for public distribution. We've asked our federal partners and our state partners, particularly around Carnival, and uh, are working within the administration to identify some funds to purchase them ourselves. Understand that until this month, we were reliably supplied with at-home tests through the state from the federal government, and that abruptly ended. So we're now trying to backfill what we had been distributing. We still have lots of testing options out there for PCR, whether it's clinics, health systems, or the drive-throughs in partnership with LDH and the National Guard. Um, so there's plenty of tests out there. They are seeing longer turnaround times um, of up to three or four days, which I know is not ideal for folks, uh, but hopefully as the national surge eases, those will improve. So as we prepare for large events that are coming our way, um, I'll say that we've been working with the CDC and national public health experts for months talking about Carnival and thinking through uh, you know, the risk to the city. And in our most recent conversation, they were very, very strongly in support of the continued mask mandate, continued vaccine and test mandate, and the need to stress boosters um, and really do communication and outreach. So we've got uh, a big communication campaign on multiple fronts with NOLA Ready and some, some of the tourism partners, making sure that folks understand when you come to New Orleans what the expectations are. But what we would ask of everyone is that do not do any events if you're not feeling well. Even if it's a tickle in your throat or you know, you're sneezing more than usual or you're achy or have a headache, um, you could potentially continue and worsen transmission to someone who could get very sick. So just stay home. Um, if you have tests, if, you are if, if we're able to get home tests, if you're able to get some at the, at the drugstore, um, do as many of you did before Christmas. Uh, if you're going to the ball, if you're going to the party, do a test before you walk out the door just to make sure, give yourself that level of protection for yourself and everyone else. Please keep your mask on indoors. The mask mandate applies to all indoor spaces. This includes parties, balls, uh, stores, libraries, Everywhere you go indoors, it is critical that you keep your mask on unless you're actively eating and drinking. I, I just can't stress this enough. Um, outdoors events are generally safer, but again, if you're cramming thousands of people into a very small outdoor space, then that, that risk is not you know, lessened nearly as much. But in general, being outdoors where in well-ventilated spaces is going to be safer. Please get your booster if you haven't already. Uh, there's lots of places to do it. And, you know, I would just say, pace yourself. You don't, you know, if, if you have a decision of should you go to 10 parties, maybe this is not the year to do all of them uh, because every one is an opportunity to either contract or spread the virus. Uh, lots of places to find vaccinations. Uh, we've, NOLA Ready Calendar has been great. We have two large events on Saturday, one on the West Bank, one in New Orleans East um, that are gonna have all kinds of vaccinations uh, as well as flu vaccines. So there's no shortage of places to get it. And I think that's it. I will stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Dr. Abegno. Um, council members, do you have any questions? Going once, going twice. Um, I do have a question about uh, vaccination sites during Mardi Gras. I know that there are a lot of folks who come in from out of town and who might need their vaccine cards or show some proof of vaccination. Are is the city setting up any vaccine sites during this time so that out of towners or, or even in towners can get vaccinated during Mardi Gras? Yeah, so we we are going to keep our current sites running uh, for most of the holiday. Um, I'll say that for folks coming by airport, Oshner has run a vaccine clinic there since July, and it has been wildly successful. That's going to remain open. So that's perfect. If you need your booster and want to get off the plane and get your booster, you can do that. Uh, it's a great service. The National Guard sites will be open their normal hours, except for the Monday and Tuesday of Carnival. Um, and that, that's testing and vaccines. So that's another easy way people can do it. Um, I know that some of the providers are maybe gonna shut down Monday and Tuesday. 
I'll say that the drugstores have lots of availability. Um, I just got my 12 year old, her booster uh, last week at a Walgreens. It was super easy, made the appointment online. So there's, all, there's gonna be the same amount of uh, capacity we have now, except probably for that Monday and Tuesday of Carnival. Great, and on the home tests, if somehow the city gets their hands on them, will there be a distribution center or I'm sure there will be press around that? Yeah, what we did with the last tranche that we got from the state, which was a lot less than we had ordered, was worked with our partners that we've been distributing tests to get the tests to folks who had the least access, right? Who couldn't, you know, hear on Twitter that the Costco had them and run out and get some. So our homeless service providers, our DV shelter providers, um, those working with non-English speaking folks, those in the areas I, sh I mentioned that had lower vaccination rates, higher case rates, um, and really working through those community groups uh, because we've had great success with them distributing the tests out uh, really, really easily and quickly. So we'll hope to do that on a ramped up basis. We do hope um, that if some of our state and federal assets come through, we will have testing available at our first aid stations on the Mardi Gras route. So that if you're out and you wanna get a test, you know we can, we can make it happen for you right there. I would love to do more events as we did right before Christmas when we were able to give away everything we had at, um, at fire stations, they were a great partner. So it just depends on how many we get. If we get enough, then we'd love to do that. Um, but we do just wanna make sure it's an equitable distribution so those who might have the least access can get the test that they need. Sorry, uh, thank you so much. And if there are no more questions from the council folks, council people, um, we can move to agenda item number four, um, homeless initiatives, uh, Dr. Begno, and Ms. Wilman will present first, and then we will hear from community. Yeah, I think you guys will get tired of me today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and find that one. Okay, hopefully this is the right one. Um, it should say encampment cleaning and outreach updates. If it doesn't, please let does. me know. Okay, great. Um, so again, we really appreciate the, the opportunity. We came and presented to the previous council last year about this, um, but since there are so many of, of you all who are new, I'm really, really glad we're doing this early and um, happy to have our colleagues from OCD and Unity here. And for us, it, I just want, want to sort of uh, explain what is the health department's role in addressing homelessness? Homelessness is incredibly complex. There is no one agency or department uh, that has all the answers. And that's why we work in partnerships and we're, we're proud to do so. What our role is, is really to understand and assess the public health issues and threats. And we do that a couple of different ways. We have Healthcare for the Homeless Clinic, which is the primary care services uh, medical, behavioral health, dental for homeless individuals. We have uh, three locations. It's been around for 30 years and that's you know a very traditional clinic model and has been very successful. We help to coordinate the encampment cleaning and outreach efforts on public property. And I'll, I'll dive into those in a little bit. We cannot go on private property uh, and do anything that's, that we're prohibited from doing that. It's, that's a separate issue, but uh, encampments that pop up, whether it's under the bridge or um, at a city facility where we were this morning at the Naval Support Station, um, we, we help to coordinate and, um, and do the job that needs to be done there. We've been providing vaccinations and tests throughout COVID for our homeless and unsheltered individuals. And we work with OCD and others to coordinate services in disaster settings. So we've got another freeze night coming up this weekend. We've had several in the last couple of weeks, making sure that folks are not um, unduly threatened by the adverse weather and making sure they have a place to go. Um, what the health department doesn't do is case management, rental assistance, rehousing, permanent supportive housing, sheltering, or any direct aid. Um, you're gonna hear from OCD and Unity who do many of these functions, um, we work together, but we do not have the capacity or the staff to do those particular services. So 
what are the goals of our encampment outreach and cleaning, cleaning ef efforts? This is really part of our harm reduction mission. We understand that um, the paths to homelessness are many, the reasons are many, and the paths out are varied as well. And there's really no one size fit fit all intervention that magically works, um, not just in New Orleans, but anywhere across the country. Every city struggles with this in their own way. So our immediate goals from a health perspective are identifying infectious conditions, stopping any potential spread of rodent or pest-borne disease. So, uh, you know, soiled pans of food that people dump off meaning well, but maybe not are huge vectors for outbreaks of disease. Um, and so trying to keep places as clean as possible so that those don't happen is really important. Uh, we identify any acute physical or mental health needs that are uh, obvious during a visit. And with our partners on site like Unity, uh, like Traveler's Aid and others, we get those folks what they need. If there is an acute medical issue, and there has been on many of these, then we have the staff that can identify that, quickly get that person to emergent medical care. We want to get rid of garbage, hazardous materials, things that accumulate um, in a way that is safe for everybody there. Um, and above all, we want to treat those who are unsheltered in our city uh, with respect and compassion and work with them to get them closer to being off the streets. Uh, there is a city ordinance that governs what we do and don't do uh, for outreach. We have uh, several encampments that are, are regular that we know about, and about every other Wednesday uh, is when we go out and do the events. This is a multi-agency affair. It is uh, several different departments within the city that come together and some external partners. So it's not something that can just happen you know, in a day. It has to be done right. And so that's why we try to do them regularly and scheduled and everybody sort of knows what the schedule is. Uh, per the ordinance, we do noticing, explaining to the residents that we're, we'll be coming in the next day, 24 hours in advance. And that allows the residents to identify and temporarily move their personal property so we can get a better, <coughs> better cleaning and identify what is garbage and what's not. Um, sanitation are wonderful partners in this and they, they really, really work hard to throw away everything that is garbage um, and really do some, some deep cleaning and pressure washes in the places that need it most. Uh, since COVID, we've had hand washing stations and portalettes at some of these places. And so we inspect them, make sure they're being cleaned regularly. But most importantly, it's an opportunity for our service providers to connect with people, to meet new individuals, and again, get them closer through the system of transitioning out of homelessness. And so roughly every other week, actually a little bit more than that, since May of 2021, we have been out there doing these. And we've been in every district, um, you know, more than once. Uh, so you just some pictures, because I think they tell the story. Certainly everybody's noticed things like this. And these are our sanitation guys working hard um, and really leaving it in a much better, uh, much better state than they found it. In the summer, we piloted the ability for citizens to call 311 and report an encampment. We certainly know of the regular ones, but sometimes ones pop up. And so that's an opportunity for us to take our partners and go out and assess what the needs are there. Um, so we've done that and uh, we encourage the public to continue to do that. We've provided, I think 130 hours is a little bit of a low ball, um, but in between the cleanups, uh, we try to have a presence with these individuals to build trust. Um, you know, many of them are very, very wary of anybody from the city um, coming out, whether that's justified or not. And so we really want to make sure they, they trust us and will work with us because we know that's the step that gets them into whatever they need, whether it's substance abuse treatment, whether it's a case manager, whether it's to go into a shelter. So we do a lot of outreach um, in, in between so that they get to know my team's uh, faces and they, they recognize when we're coming. Um, this is just a short list of our our partners that come with us, uh, there's several more that come as they can, but we're really, really grateful for their help. 
And again, we've given many, many uh, vaccinations. We know this is a high risk population, particularly when they're living in congregate settings like shelters. So we've been with um, our other vaccine partners to all of the shelters multiple times as well on the streets, under the bridge, trying to vaccinate as many people as possible. Um, and just a few more uh, pictures of our, our uh, great sanitation partners, um, pressure washing, making things clean. Um, we wanted to get a sense, we wanted to make sure that we were doing these in a way that they would be welcomed, um, because if we're not doing a good job and the folks are, um, you know, upset or feel threatened by what we're doing, then they're not going to be effective. And so we, um, we reached out when we started redoing the sweeps just to sort of see how people felt about it and to get a sense of who's on the street. I will say that every year... Um, nationwide, there is a point in time count where advocates and workers go out and attempt to get a count of how many homeless people are both on the street and in shelters. That's actually happening two weeks or about a week and a half from now. So Unity might talk more about that. Uh, it's a tricky thing to do, but it does help us give a sense. You know, right now we estimate there's about a thousand or so individuals between shelters and on the street, most of them sheltered. Uh, but we'll get some really good information as to how that's changed in a few weeks. Um, overwhelmingly, people like the cleanups. They're grateful for the cleanups. Um, and so that, you know, that was a, a good validation of our, our efforts and uh, work, you know, want to keep continuing it. But just want to start at some of the other interesting findings is about 50% of people, when we talk to them, have a caseworker who is helping you find housing, which means about half don't. And again, these, these are opportunities to get that other half into the category of at least having someone they can talk to. As I'm sure my colleagues will say, it's a very long process to be able to qualify for several types of housing. And so the earlier you get hooked up, the better. And also, interestingly, you know, many of these folks do not want to be in a shelter for a variety of different reasons. Um, and that is just sort of what it is. I think the low barrier shelter has come a long way in convincing people who maybe were shelter resistant. And I think the expansion that uh, my colleagues will talk about is gonna help further with that. Um, but there are a good number of people who are very reticent about going into a shelter. And so that's a little bit about what we do. You know, the long-term solution to end homelessness means more housing, more affordable housing, increased mental health services and addiction services, all of which many of us are working on. Um, but it's a, it's a Herculean task and I'll say no city has fi figured it out yet. So we're gonna keep focusing on what we can do from a health perspective and working with our partners. Um, so again, I will stop there. And I don't know if there are any questions before moving on to OCD. Council members, any questions for Dr. Begno? No? Um, I, I do have uh, just a couple questions. Um, the 80% of folks who say they're not interested in a shelter, do you have any sense of why? Yeah, actually there's a couple of themes that emerge. Um, and this is true of, I think, many homeless populations, particularly those in sort of warm areas like New Orleans and Miami and other places, is that there are some people who just come and pass through and they're on the streets for a couple of months and they kind of go with the seasons. And so they're not interested in long term. There are some who have significant mental illness that makes shelter very um, scary for them. Being around a lot of people in a closed building is challenging with their particular mental illness. And so um, there, part of it is that. And then part of it is that, particularly prior to the low barrier shelter, um, there were barriers to being in a shelter. Uh, in some shelters have a particular religious bent where you have to subscribe to a particular program in order to be in that shelter. Some after the first two weeks require you to pay $5 a day. Um, some folks felt that they weren't treated well at some of these um, at some of these shelters, uh, and so had a bad experience and didn't want to go back. Um, I see Tim Murphy from from our team on here. Tim, is that did I hit all the reasons, or is there anything else that um, you'd like to mention? Uh, 
No, that sounds about right. And then just anecdotally in our conversations, it really is, um, you know, past experiences with current shelters here. But as Dr. Vegno, you know, mentioned, it's the low barrier shelter solves a lot of those problems. And we are hearing really uh, good feedback. So folks who in the past um, were turned off by some of the shelters in existence um, are happy to are, are happy with the low barriers presented by that shelter. Um, and that's whether it's if they're working weird hours, and a lot of people do work weird hours, um, some shelters have our limitations of when you're allowed to be there or not, or when you're allowed to come back. Um, or if you want to stay with your partner, I mean, I know personally, I wouldn't want to stay anywhere without my wife. Um, and then that's, that's a big barrier for a lot of people, or your pet, or your grant, whatever else it is. So that, I think that is a lot of it, um, in addition to those either mental health um, issues, or just the fact, I'm only here for a week, I'll be gone next week, don't worry about it. Um, your team said, Dr. Vigno, you said it's about a thousand um, unhomed people, and I, I assume that number fluctuates depending on people passing through. Um, do you, does your team understand any of the root causes or have a sense of the root causes for um, why folks are unhomed? Oh, sure. Um, you know, there is a, certainly poverty and uh, economic instability. Um, you know, for many, uh, you know, over 50% of ho households in the region are Alice, right? They're low income, income constrained. So there is a very thin line between being able to make your rent and being homeless for many, many of our families, um, which is tragic. Then there are others for whom mental illness or substance abuse makes it very challenging for them to remain in housing or to remain with their family, right? There's a lot of folks who who their family just can't deal with them anymore. Um, and so unfortunately they're, they're on the streets. Um, and then, you know, just sort of the overall lack of affordable housing and the limitations of the voucher programs. Right. And I, I know I, I, OCD will, will speak to this. There are more people that need to be served than we have units and or vouchers for. Great. Thank you. I see, um, Councilmember Thomas, do you have some questions? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Vigno, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, on the homeless situation, uh, you know, usually uh, over the last several decades, it's been contained to the, usually in most cities in urban areas, contained to the central business district uh, on the city core. What we see now, though, is it being stretched out, especially in the urban core. I don't see it in the suburbs or some of the older suburban communities, even around their business districts. But we see it uh, moving from uh, the CBD, the center city area, uh, out to the edges of other neighborhoods. Uh, why and why do we see it here, especially when, when the needs are the same uh, in old suburban areas? Yeah, I will say that there are homeless in suburban areas. Um, they are often not acknowledged. I will say there was a pretty tragic incident a few weeks ago in a, in a neighboring parish um, where a bulldozer just came and bulldozed an encampment like we would see and seriously injured someone because there, there was sort of this, well, it doesn't matter. There, there's not going to be, there's not homeless here. So there's not going to be anybody here. Um, and I think there's a failure to recognize that there are homeless elsewhere. There are homeless in rural areas as well. Why they tend to cluster in urban areas, not just here, but across the country is because that's where the services are, right? That's where, whether it's the service providers or the soup kitchens or, um, you know, the hospitals, the healthcare systems that will take homeless people, they tend to be clustered in downtown areas. So you see it all over the, all over the country. They have always been in New Orleans pockets, small encampments that I think flew under the radar in every district, right? Particularly in, in your district, lots of little pockets out in the east and they, they didn't really cause a whole lot of trouble and they sort of surfaced every now and then, but it wasn't the same concentration. I think we are, for whatever reason, we're getting greater visibility on them because certainly our team is getting called out to address them, I think there is an awareness that, oh, there are people here living behind this particular nook and cranny. Um, and so we need to help them. I think also with the rise of substance abuse, um, many, many, uh, a lot of times we get called because folks are in parks using 
drugs and that that is more prominent certainly than it was 10 years ago. And again, that's true in New Orleans, that's true elsewhere. So whether or not the numbers have magnified, I mean, you know, our homeless population has decreased 90 fold since it ballooned after Katrina. So in comparing to other cities, we do not have the homeless problem that in LA or San Francisco do. But I do think that the face of homelessness has changed. And I think you're right in that it's not as completely concentrated in the downtown areas as it as it was. Uh, where are the uh, state of the art tents coming from? <laughs> so there are um, organizations and individuals who routinely hand out tents. Um, and in the past, it was a practice that obviously soiled tents or tents, you know, were, were thrown away that did nothing to stop the proliferation of tents. Um, and so I believe there was some person after Hurricane Ida who those tents came from one of the music festivals that didn't happen, Coachella or something like that, came and brought a whole bunch of, of tents. Um, when we go to clean, generally residents move the tents so everything is washed and cleaned underneath um, and then they move them right back. They're, they're, the ordinance is, is both lists tents as both a prohibited and a personal item. Um, and so we have always, we've chosen to err on make sticking to the health and safety and identifying the health risk uh, because as soon as you take tents away, they come right back. But is it uh, to allow, uh, especially uh, a, uh, a disparate population or a, a population that struggles to allow them to assemble, especially unabatedly like that in the middle of COVID, doesn't that add to a greater health risk for everyone? It can, um, you know, individuals in individual tents, I will say is probably the same or a lessened risk than in a congregate setting. If, you know, if, if we're talking pure public health, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've, we're very fortunate that the state of Louisiana since the beginning of COVID has had an isolation facility for homeless individuals mm -hmm. so that, we don't have to send COVID positive individuals to a congregate setting. Um, and that has worked pretty well. There's a lot of places that don't have that. It's not perfect by any means, um, but it, it's, it's been helpful in reducing the risk in the population. Are there any places where you can't panhandle or set up tents? Is it, is, are there any places where it's not a permitted use? So panhandling and tents are very different. Pan, the panhandlers you see are generally not those who are living in the encampments and tents. They're generally driving in and that's their business, right? That's, that's what they've chosen to do. So those are two completely separate things. Right. Um, again, I think you have to be very careful uh, when you're talking about, we do not clear encampments because there's some, some federal legal decisions that have, you know, said that that is illegal to clear, to forcibly remove people. Um, and so that's the direction we've always gotten from our law department. There are some very, very um, strong legal advocates who are quite aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's why we, we sort of have chosen the path that we have in terms of the cleaning and outreach. Well, no, I'm, just, I'm just asking uh, questions, that's all. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, for I think it was an essence event uh, before COVID, uh, there was a clearing or a cleaning and they disappeared for a while and came back. I, it's been in the last few years. I, I remember specifically. So how did that happen then? I'm Maybe not sure unless it was on it, private. You know, I am, yeah. Uh, unless it was on private property. No, it sure. was under the uh, Pontchartrain Expressway. There, there was a, uh, a major event in the city. As a matter of fact, people talked about it publicly. There was a major event in the city, and they were all removed. But then when the event was over, they all came back. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I used to, well, I still am with the Good Morning Show and reporting the news and stuff like that. 
uh, the, yeah, that was a real occurrence just in the last few years. Yeah, I don't believe the health department was involved in that, so I don't know how it okay. happened. I, I'm not sure. Okay. 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 So it's it's uh it's not a prohibited uh, use uh, in terms of setting up shop or setting them up in camp in campus. It's a permitted use, right? Again, the ordinance. I, I you know I would I would defer to the law department on this, but I, the ordinance is not entirely clear. And so we've chosen to, you know, walk the line of, well, you know. Well, I'm asking the question because, uh, I mean, you know, no one, you know, I, I'm as involved in, in, in helping folk and feeding folk. I've been doing that my whole life, you know, taking kids in, even in my own home. So, but I, I, I'm asking in terms of consistency, you know, and uh, what are the rules and what are not the rules and what can you do and, and what, what can't you do? And it just seems like we're in, in the middle of a whole lot of uncertainty about a lot of rules, you know, from crime to dumping to litter to uh, homelessness to panhandling. And and I know Council Member uh, Harris is really, really big on this quality of life thing. And, you know, as we travel around and move around, there's cities like ours too uh, that deal with the same things, but it just doesn't seem like this is onslaught of stuff, you know, and especially right in the middle of a, uh, I think one of the, uh, a mental health era where people are really concerned about how they feel in their mental health and, and, and you know, a little bit of Ida and post Katrina and a whole lot of COVID, uh, it just seems like so many pieces of stuff uh, that seem to be more controlled uh, are kind of chipping at people's uh, uh, state of mind uh, of mental health here right now. And, uh, I, you know, I just think that it's some, we got to get a handle on it. Uh, you know, you know I, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just concerning to me because as we talk to people on the show, as we talk to people and move around, and uh, now as, it, as an elected official, and I'm going to walk a community today, you know, uh, where there was some violence. It just seems like in every area, you know, when we're talking about quality of life, uh, our community, it, it seems to be more, it seems to be more stretched and more challenged. And I know other cities are dealing with violence and homelessness, but it's like we can check all the boxes here right now. And uh, I don't know if that's healthy uh, for our mental health uh, and healthy for our culture or healthy for our children. So whatever we can do or I can do, uh, I'm here to help. Thank you. Any other council people have questions for Dr. Vegno or Ms. Wilman? Thank you, appreciate it. Um, next up, we have uh, Martha Kegel and uh, Angela Patterson from Unity. Oh, I think I think Ms. Wellman had a presentation as yeah. well. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, and I, I have um, just a quick update on um, the low barrier shelter. So the Office of Community Development, um, we have indirect roles uh, with homelessness. So we provide funding. Uh, we collaborate with other offices. Um, of course, you know, housing development and stabilization. And we also provide some oversight over the low barrier shelter. So in 2018, um, the, the first phase of the low barrier shelter opened, uh, and that was in August, around August or the fall of 2018. And then uh, in February of last year, uh, we the city broke ground on the phase two expansion of the low barrier shelter, which is gonna be about a 200% uh, increase in capacity. It's going from 100 beds to 346 beds. So that second floor, the original uh, footprint of the low barrier shelter has been expanded and pushed out. And then uh, the phase two goes into the third floor. So it's going to provide more supportive services. Uh, that was a $5.2 million um, um, uh, investment into um, uh, that, that, um, that shelter, as well as a $3 million investment in Ozanam Inn, which is not a city owned shelter, but it is centrally located. It has been moved over to the Padres uh, Street location and now it's serving women. So 
uh, one of the goals of the mayor was to centralize resources uh, and increase the capacity of uh, shelters and offer some more supportive services for the homeless population in a smaller confined area. So that, um, that was the reasoning for expanding um, the shelter to phase two. So uh, we're excited, uh, it's very close to completion and we expect that uh, it'll be um, completed very soon. I have Tara um, Johnson Brown from my office. Um, she works with the homeless population the most. She has the most experience um, in our office, certainly uh, with the population. And uh, she has been involved on the development of the shelter. And Tara, if it's anything you'd like to share, please feel free to do so. We're good. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, but we, as I said earlier, our relationship is indirect. We've worked very closely with Unity. Um, uh, we've worked also with the state um, to provide non-congregate sheltering. Um, and that, that is something that we did uh, uh, about a year ago um, where 600 people were placed into hotel rooms, moved over to uh, permanent housing. And then again, currently there are uh, individuals that are in non-congregate shelters. So I know Ms. Um, Martha will talk about that, but um, that's just a little bit about what we're doing. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Council Member Thomas. Yeah, is there a mental health component to uh, what you guys are doing over at the Low Barrier Shelter? Yes, so absolutely. So supportive services are provided. Um, they're provided through the operator as well as Unity. There are case workers that come on site. They do an assessment of each person that, um, that resides there and to determine what uh, su supportive services they are in need of. So yes, that is one of the assessments. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a limit on the amount of time that someone can stay in the low barrier shelter? No, um, I, we have uh, enacted policy though to limit the, uh, the, the time of stay. And the reason being because we did find that uh, in the beginning, the first year, which the shelter filled up to capacity within a month, uh, we found that there were some folks that were actually uh, refusing uh, units, apartments that were offered to them and preferring to stay in a group style setting, which is not really what it's designed for. So. Uh, we did uh, add policy where they only have uh, a couple times where they can turn down housing. Uh, so the average stay, I believe, is about 90 days. Um, but uh, there, I think the longest person that ever stayed might have been nine months. Or Tara, if you can recall, or something yeah, like that. We we do have one that was more than a year. That's why we put it in there. But that person had been offered um, housing like eight or nine times. Every time they get to a unit um, through the housing search and all, they decline the housing. So that's why we implemented that policy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, so, had, uh, so uh, yes. So our, our goals is to use the funding that we receive. Uh, we receive emergency solutions grant. We also use um, other funding that we have to move folks from uh, the shelters, as soon as we realize they're in a position to move on to permanent housing, our goal is to facilitate that movement as quick as possible so that it will free up a, a, a shelter bed. What, uh, so what percentage of people who uh, stay at the low barrier shelter actually receive permanent housing? Do you have that data? I do not, but every no one stays for, you know, permanently, but I can get you the data in terms of how long this stay and where they go after that. I mean, some might choose to just go back on the street. Is that correct? Very few. Okay. Very. Few. Um, and this might be a question for Unity, but what are the total amount of beds available um, through all of the organization, Osnum Inc., Covenant House, the Low Barrier Shelter? Tara, do you have that information? Or I do not, not and you okay. don't have that information because of the continuum. We only fund um, the agencies that uh, it's, that's funded through the city process, but because they're the continuum and they have, they fund more agencies, they'll be able to provide that information. Um, and I think this is my final question, but y'all say to the end of unity. Um, I heard, and I hate to talk rumor, but I heard that there is um, a plan to do sort of an outdoor area um, where folks can move from right here by the bridge to someplace else that has um, convenience stations and 
restrooms, things like that, and they can put their tents there and it's fenced. Is that a plan that the city has? Not that I'm aware of currently, but it was, that was something that was investigated some time ago um, prior to uh, expending the 5.2 million in the low barrier shelter expansion. It was decided uh, because of the weather and some other issues um, that it'd be best to, to um, expand the, the low barrier shelter as opposed to an outdoor type setting. Are there any model cities that you all look to um, to see what can be done? I mean, I, I don't like to reinvent the wheel. We're not the only city that has um, a homeless issue, um, which, you know, affordable housing, everything. But are there any model cities that you all look to to say this is what we should be doing? I mean, honestly, I would defer to uh, unity on that because um, our role is just kind of indirect um, uh, in terms of the funding piece of it. Um, but I definitely would um, defer to unity. Um, I, this is a long, longer conversation that we're going to continue to have um, throughout this year. Um, but thank you both for appearing. If unity is here, if we could get them teed up, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all ready? Yeah. Let's see. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Harris. It's nice to meet you on Zoom and it's great to see uh, Councilman Jeruso and Councilman Thomas and um, Councilman uh, King and is Councilman Green here as well? Um, but uh, thank you so much for inviting us to present today. Um, and I just wanna thank the city, thank Marjoriana and Dr. Avegno and Tyra because um, all of the accomplishments that have been done are, are only possible because of this partnership with the city that is um, you know, very effective. Um, so first, a little bit of background about Unity. Um, we uh, are a nonprofit coordinating the local homeless continuum of care of 60 nonprofit and governmental agencies. Our mission is to prevent, reduce, and end homelessness in New Orleans, Jefferson Parish, and the city of Kenner. And below is a list of our member organizations. Um, next slide, we're designated uh, by uh, the federal government, as well as the city of New Orleans, Jefferson Parish, and city of Kenner as the lead agency that's responsible for applying for a competitive federal funding stream called the HUD continuum of care grants that provides homeless housing and services uh, for the entire community, uh, distributing grants uh, to our member agencies and we oversee their work and in partnership with BeaLink, we collect data on homelessness through our homeless management information system as well as the annual point in time counts. Um, so the good news is that we know what works to end people's homelessness. The evidence-based practice is rent assistance coupled with case management. And it's actually cost effective compared to the cost of leaving people on the streets where they end up having deteriorating health, both physical and mental, having to use costly emergency room services. And they end up getting arrested frequently for things like public urination or sleeping on the sidewalk, which would not occur, wouldn't be relevant if they had a place to live. Um, Homelessness is a persistent problem here, as we've all been talking about, as it is in every major city in the United States. Um, and study after study has shown that what determines um, uh, whether what a city's rate per capita rate of homelessness is compared to their general population has everything to do. The primary factor is the degree to which that city uh, has an acute shortage of affordable rental housing. So that is far and away the biggest determination of um, how, how large your homeless population is gonna be relative to your uh, general population. Not to say that there aren't other factors, but that is the one thing that really determines um, what, what your rate of homelessness is gonna look like. Um, so, um, but the good news is also that working uh, together with the city in partnership with the federal government and the state, 
uh, we have been able to achieve a 91% reduction in homelessness uh, since 2007, which was the high watermark of homelessness after Katrina, when we had thousands of people squatting in abandoned buildings, in addition to our first really huge homeless encampments at right outside City Hall and at Claiborne. And, you know, we've, we've continued to, ha to have a significant uh, problem with homelessness, but uh, we have been able to drive it down by really using uh, rent assistance and case management effectively to help as many people as possible. And if you look at the last two years of this chart, you can see that we have we made significant progress during the pandemic, which is very different from most cities in the United States. Most cities in the United States saw homelessness soar during the pandemic. And because we use something very innovative in partnership with the city and the state who deserve you know, full credit for that, um, we were able to use hotels to both protect people from the pandemic but also be a staging ground to get them into uh, permanent housing, to get them into apartments, again, using pandemic homeless housing resources that were made available by the federal government. We did that so effectively that we drove down the number of people experiencing homelessness from 1,314 in the one night count in 2020 and to, down to 1,042 in 2021. Um, so next slide. It's particularly interesting to look at the unsheltered homeless population, which of course, since unsheltered homelessness, meaning people actually sleeping on the street, in their cars, in abandoned buildings, as opposed to sheltered homelessness, where people are living in an emergency shelter. Unsheltered homelessness is obviously the most dire kind of homelessness. It also causes a quality of life problem for every person in the city. Um, but it also leads to, you know, a, a high death rate among people living outside. So we pay particular attention to unsheltered homelessness. And we have seen, you know, we have seen uh, just a real, um, a real dramatic peaks and valleys in unsheltered homelessness during this pandemic. Um, it, we would have expected it to go to, to soar up, you know, upward without without a uh, stop, except for the hotel initiative. So in January of 2020, we had 505 unsheltered homeless people in that year's point in time count. And starting in March, the city, state and unity used hotels to get virtually every homeless person off the street for their protection. And we drove down that number to 30 from 555 to only 30 June 1st. Then it started climbing again with other people who were newly homeless uh, as a result of the economic turndown in particular. Um, and that number kept climbing. We estimate it got to about 530 when we started this year's hotel initiative, which we didn't get permission from FEMA to restart that until August, there was a lot of advocacy. Dr. Vegno was involved with that as well. And starting in August, we uh, took another 389 people off the street, placed them in hotels. And so we pulled down that number to what we estimate is probably about 200 people on the street now. So as bad as things are, and every homeless person, you know, that's a tragedy that someone having to experience that, but it could be so much worse if it weren't for, um, you know, what has been done that was so innovative uh, on the part of the city and the state uh, working with its nonprofit partners. Next slide. I just want to say a few more words about the hotel initiative. So in the 2020 uh, hotel initiative between March and November, uh, 618 unsheltered people were taken off the street to hotels. In addition, the domestic violence agencies and the VA also took other homeless people off the street. And 76% of those folks were placed in permanent housing. More would have been, but the pandemic permanent housing resources, uh, the timing of that was delayed. So not everyone got into permanent housing. Uh, so that was like a major innovation that you all should be really proud of. 
Next slide is about this year's um, vaccination and housing initiative. Um, one thing that was very different this year is that one of the reasons why we persuaded FEMA to let us do it again was because we were using it to help folks get vaccinated. Um, the efforts to vaccinate people on the street were very unsuccessful. Um, you can imagine that if you're gonna have side effect vaccine, you don't wanna experience those having to sleep on concrete outside. So it was very effective to offer people hotel rooms and then to be able to use that as a staging ground to get people into apartments. So um, of the 389 people, we still have 282 people in the hotels right now while they're developing full immunity, in many cases waiting for their second shot um, and waiting for apartments. Um, that whole process is a very labor intensive effort. Unfortunately, no more clients can be accepted into the program because there are no more funds available for hotel rooms. And we desperately need landlords to come forward and help us, especially if they have one bedroom and efficiencies. There is rent assistance available. There are landlord financial incentives available. There is case management services that will be provided. And we ask any interested landlords to contact. Next slide. Uh, I do wanna briefly talk about the challenge that lies ahead. Um, I do think that we are going to see homelessness. Now, this is an inflection point. Homelessness is probably gonna start rising again because we don't have any more hotel rooms. And every week there are new people who were not homeless last week who are homeless this week because we have such a high rate of poverty because we have such a shortage of affordable rental housing, which Hurricane Ida made so much worse. Apartments were taken off the market then. There have been rent increases since then. Those are driving factors in homelessness. As I think um, Councilman Thomas and, and uh, Dr. Avegno referred to, you know, the pandemic has caused a lot of family stress, a rise in depression, anxiety, substance use. This has all been documented a rise in domestic violence, another cause of homelessness. And so there's just a lot of things, including that our local economy and state economy is having a slower recovery than some other areas. All of these things, um, you know, I think homelessness is gonna continue to be um, a challenge. But on the other hand, next slide, um, there are, opportunities that if we use them really wisely, I think we can continue to really tamp down those numbers. Um, there is pandemic relief that hasn't been allocated yet, like the home ARP program, uh, the city's expansion of the low barrier shelter, thanks to uh, Mayor Cantrell is a major achievement that I think will reduce the numbers of people having to live on the street when that expansion uh, is complete. And um, there are some other things as well, but, but, but there really are some great opportunities if we're very smart about reducing homelessness. And that's what we're all about, um, reducing it. Let's try to keep the numbers down as low as we can get them. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, my personal hero, who um, is Angela Patterson, um, our deputy director who uh, runs our award-winning street outreach program and many other client programs. She has two master's degrees, one in social work, one in public health. Um, and I present Angela. Thank you very much, Martha. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this extraordinary team. The purpose of outreach teams are to assist people who are living on the streets in abandoned buildings, in cars, or other uninhabitable places in order to help them to secure decent, safe, and sanitary housing. They also need to be assisted with securing medical care and services that they so desperately need. We as outreach team workers for homeless individuals and families see ourselves as actually saving people's lives. Our goal is to end their homelessness by doing whatever is absolutely necessary to get them into permanent housing. 
We also seek to meet their immediate sheltering needs by providing and trying to motivate them to go into emergency homeless shelters if they are available. Some important facts that are really important for all of us to know about persons living on the street is that as it has been said by Dr. Avegno and others, many people are living on the street, not because they want to, but because they have significant mental and physical disabilities. And they have lived on the street, those who have for more than six months, it has been found by research to actually elevate their risk of dying seven years earlier than they otherwise would. There's also a problem as has been noted by several of you during the course of this meeting that with traditional shelters, there's problems with short supplies of beds. And it's difficult for many people to access the traditional shelters because of the nighttime charges the short limits on the time that they can stay there. They have to leave early in the morning and come back that night. They don't accept couples together in the shelter. And many times people have pets which cannot go into most shelters. People who work late at night have a hard time accessing traditional shelters. And there are a variety of mental and medical physical problems which discourage people who will not and are not going to sleep in a congregate shelter with all those other people in one room. Without our pandemic resources, we normally have very scarce housing resources. So that in the past, we've had to select people for housing, which was based on severity of health conditions and their length of time being homeless. The outreach team's regular activities consist normally of spending a lot of time on the street, searching for and engaging with homeless people in encampments, parks, neighborhoods throughout the city. They work daytime and night hours, and they also respond to specific calls and inquiries and referrals about people sleeping outside. Outreach's activities also involve doing on every homeless individual and family an initial assessment of the client with an assessment tool, which is called the VI SPADAT. And to do this assessment for their needs, both housing, mental health, et cetera. The referral for the person is then sent to Unity's coordinated entry in order to be referred through coordinated entry to a continuum of care housing program. The outreach work, a worker obtains docu documentation of disability and homelessness and then completes all the necessary paperwork for the client's housing application and also attends weekly navigator meetings. The outreach worker continues the engagement with the person while they are unhoused including transporting them to mental and physical health care appointments and helping them with financial assistance and job interviews. They help them find apartments and help the client move into housing. We never give up on anyone. If people refuse help, we continue to work with them and try to create a stronger relationship and help persuade them to accept help. A Norwegian writer, Mr. Arne Garborg, once said that to love a person is to learn their particular song that's in their heart and to sing it to them when even they have forgotten it. I'm going to share with you a brief story about one of our recent homeless individuals who were helped. Her name is Miss Bernadette. Miss Bernadette was living in a tent and she was encountered by homeless outreach. It was really apparent the whole time of the outreach encounters that Miss Bernadette was very sick. She was losing weight very rapidly. She went from 134 pounds to 90 pounds in the course of a year. Miss Bernadette was assisted through the homeless vaccination hotels with being admitted going into the hotel. She obtained medical treatment. She's in a housing navigation process. 
Her life is being saved by this enterprise and activity, and soon she will be in her own home. For those who are interested in accessing homeless crisis services in New Orleans, I'm going to offer you some numbers. For adults having a housing crisis, please call 504-658-2944 or 211. For families with children in a housing crisis, the phone number is 504-356-1859 or 211. For teens or young adults under age 25, please call or go to Covenant House at 504-584-1111 or 211. And for people living on the street, please call 504 504- 5709812 for emergencies at night or on the weekend call 211 everyone deserves a home and how the public can help us to end homelessness is to contribute because giving a person rental assistance only gives them a key to an empty residence an empty residence doth not a home make And we have found through research and best practices that people don't even stay in an empty place that is not feeling like home. So we need, we desperately need kitchen supplies, which are gently used. If people are doing spring cleaning, this is the perfect time to contribute to Unity's warehouse. We need gently used linens, furniture, Cleaning supplies need to be new only and also toiletries. But to do those donations, please contact the Unity Warehouse, which is located at 506 North St. Patrick Street in New Orleans, and call this number, 504-483-9300. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have some questions, but I'm sure some of the other uh, council people do as well. Mr. Duriso. Thank you, council member. Um, I don't have so much a question as a statement, which is I want to thank uh, Angela in particular um, and, and for two things. One is every time we email, their response is not only timely, but it's also thorough and thoughtful and helpful. And I can almost cut and paste and send to people who are making inquiries. So I appreciate that level of detail. And then the other thing too is, in all these conversations that we've had about crime the last couple of days and how do we utilize our resources, a lot of people and even our first reaction initially was to either let NOPD know or get in touch with the quality of life officer. We've stopped that primarily unless there's a, a violence issue. And we contact Unity as our first source of, of, of point of contact. And I just you know sort of want to remind the public that as we're looking for how we increase resources for NOPD and how we help improve um, uh, crime and blight and other quality of life issues, the very reason we're here, that Unity has been a wonderful resource and and, and in my view, at least, should be the first point of contact um, wherever possible. So that's what I just wanted to say, and I appreciate it, uh, and and the fact that you put this on the agenda today, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. If I could just clarify, whenever possible, it involves possible or documented homeless people. Thank you, Council Member Russo. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jeruso. Any other questions? Um, I also want to thank you for the work that you've done. I, I will say that there are some folks concerned about the encampment underneath um, the bridge downtown, and, and that's a constant source of conversation. Um, so my question is this, do you have a count or a census of how many folks are there um, at any given time? I believe the outreach team thinks that there's between 80 and 100 there that are actually sleeping there. Um, Does your organization have a sense of um, 
why they're there. I know I asked this to the to the city, but I, I assume it's mental health issues, substance abuse. I can answer that directly because the outreach team spends an inordinate amount of time at that particular location. Although we do go all over the city and try our best. As I said earlier, we never give up on anyone. But some of the people remaining in that encampment, the Calliope encampment, as we call it, they are either refusing vaccinations, which was part of the plan in order to bring people specific to that area into the hotels, or they are refusing outreach services outright and being very hostile to being offered ser services. And as everyone else has suggested and stated very clearly, it's due to a variety of factors, including mental health issues, um, cultural biases, and all kinds of other factors, which we are continuing to address and to try to engage these people who we are encountering, who are refusing services, we never give up on anyone. If I if I could if I could add to that, it's interesting to note that um, in 2020, when we did the hotel initiative, we had enough resources that we could literally take everyone off the street, and so the 30 people who were left were people who refused hotel rooms. I mean. Uh, we talk about people refusing uh, shelter. Almost no one will refuse a hotel room uh, because it's, you know, a private space. And some people don't want to live in a big room with a bunch of other people, understandably, but almost everyone will accept a hotel room. But there are a few people who would, about 30. Um, this time, though, this initiative was about vaccination. So, um, you know, that was another barrier that you know they and plus we didn't have limitless resources this year um at the end of november fema stopped paying um so we're using some other resources and now they've run out for the hotels so um it's not to say that those folks wouldn't have accepted hotels or wouldn't accept the low barrier shelter when it opens but um we weren't able to help them with this initiative yet and as Angela said, some, some of them are quite mentally ill. You know, there's, there, there are a lot of issues there. Uh, but study after study shows that the major reason why people are out there is affordable housing. It's just who is out there often has to do with the people who have the particular vulnerabilities, if that makes sense. It does, and you anticipated my, my next question. I, I think Council Member Thomas asked why, um, why that is such an attractive location. And I think Dr. Begno said because there's access to services. So if we were looking to build um, affordable housing, would you recommend that it be somewhere located, you know, downtown so that the service, services can still be accessed? I think for um, people who have experienced homelessness um, that definitely a lot of people would need services and having it be someplace that is close to public transportation, close to services would be ideal. Um, we did after Katrina create uh, some permanent supportive housing buildings that were specifically designed for people uh, who had long histories of chronic homelessness and disabilities. And they are not necessarily right downtown but fairly close to downtown, Central City, um, you know, lower, lower mid city, um, you know, any location that is close to public transportation, close to, you know, stores where you can get something to eat, um, and you know, obviously close to medical care. That those are all very useful things. But we place most of the people that we permanently house, we're placing in apartment buildings all around the city. And usually people want to live where they were living before they became homeless. So usually they wanna go back to their neighborhood, whether that's Gentilly, whether that is the Lower Ninth Ward, whether that is Lakeview, whether that is Metairie, you know, it could be 
wherever they lived before is usually where they want to go back to. Um, I asked the city this, and I, I wonder if you have a take on a model city that we can emulate um, in order. It sounds like you guys are doing great work, but are there any model cities who do this well, this work well? Yes, I do. I do like that you said, um, I, I, I think that New Orleans is actually a model city and people look to us all the time and ask us about how we do what we do. But I think if there's one city right now that I kind of look to, I always check what are they doing? <laughs> and try to follow what they're doing. And certainly with the hotel initiative, we did that. They were one of the places that gave us the idea is Richmond. I think Richmond is a really interesting city to look at for how they're handling homelessness. They seem to have it together pretty well. Uh, they're very well organized, using their resources really wisely because there's never enough resources. If there were enough resources, we would, we, we would, we would have only a tiny homeless population and we'd be able to house them really fast. But um, I, I think Richmond is definitely a city that I'm interested in. I also think um, you would wanna contact the, the leaders in the field on this, the national experts on this are um, a nonprofit called the National Alliance to End Homelessness, naeh.org. They are really considered the leader in the field. And then there's a, a federal agency called the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. They are also policy experts in this field about they're keeping track. Both of them are keeping track of what cities are doing what, who's having the best success. Um, if you're asking them how to run a good shelter, they know that, how to, how to use your rapid rehousing resources the best they know that they can advise you about anything you might want to know uh, between those two organizations urban institute is another organization although it doesn't focus exclusively on homelessness they do have a lot of policy expertise in that and i think the city has asked them for guidance before as well um, so I would recommend probably those three organizations if you were looking at national experts that are really keeping track of who's doing what around the country. Thank you for that. Um, and I have two questions that are probably gonna be unpopular um, to some people who are viewing, but I've, I had the suggestion uh, from a constituent that if we lit underneath the overpass that that might um, prevent some encampment. I, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I do think that people gather under the, under the overpass a lot for shelter from mm -hmm. the heat in the summer and the, you know, the rain when it's raining and it's also close to services to, for some people who may be begging, it's close to where cars are. So I think that, you know, the overpasses are, um, areas where people, uh, uh, do tend to gather uh, in larger numbers. Um, you know, I can't speak to what the city's policy decisions may be about what areas you think should be off limits, but um, people have to go somewhere. Right. Um, and until we have enough, you know, right now, another question that had come up earlier is do we have enough shelter? We don't have enough shelter. Um, we have 450 beds approximately of emergency shelter. And on a typical night, they're virtually all filled. Some of the traditional shelters may not have every bed filled, um, but because they are considered inaccessible by a lot of people out on the street, um, that's the reason. The low barrier shelter is full every night. <laughs> if, 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 if When we open the low barrier shelter, it will be full every night, um, you know, when you have a low barrier shelter uh, that, that, that really works to make it accessible to people who would otherwise be on the street, um, you know, you will find that it's 100% it's full. And that number is the current, um, the current number of beds. It sounds like it, there are another 246 beds going online in the space to build, is that correct? Right, that's right. That's what, um, yeah, and, and so, you know, we have a large sheltered population that are in the shelters and then the people out on the street are the people who couldn't find a shelter bed. And in some cases, 
wouldn't take a, a congregate shelter bed even even if it was low barrier. Um, right. And and that may be for a variety of reasons. Some people are just too paranoid to be living around other people that closely in a enclosed space. Um, and, you know, because of mental illness um, or other reasons. But uh, like I said, the hotel rooms work perfectly because almost nobody turns those down. Um, and I think this is my last question. Um, I know that a lot of Good Samaritans deliver food, the, the, the tents um, to folks in order to help. What's your take on that? And should people be delivering food or is there some alternative that advocates like yourself would prefer? Well, I think people are trying to help the best way they can. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's good to try to help through an established feeding program. Like Grace at the Green Light is a wonderful organization uh, to uh, support that um, works on feeding people experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, the problem with just taking food downtown is that there's always unintended consequences. <laughs> Uh, negative consequences to that, uh, particularly if there if there aren't bathroom facilities available, um, nobody is going to remove the uneaten food later, attracting rats, and so you know all these things um, can create problems that oftentimes you know good Samaritans aren't really thinking about all that. Um, but on the other hand, you have to eat, and um, you know people people. Um, you know, don't, don't have a lot of options. From an outreach perspective, I just wanted to add that in addition to everything that Martha says, that actually enabling the continuing comfort of people who are unsheltered and living outdoors encourages people to not work on becoming successfully permanently housed. If one is given almost everything outdoors, that makes a person comfortable and has a sense of well-being, then it seems natural to assume why should they try to leave that space? And outreach has a very, very difficult challenge regarding people who are living very comfortably, being fed well, and having various other needs supplied while on the street. It is really important to help our persons experiencing homelessness to be motivated to work towards becoming housed. And it really does make it a lot more challenging, the more services, direct types of services, such as food, such as giving people furniture on the street and making that existence so comfortable that it doesn't serve a purpose to try to become housed. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Um, do any of the other council people have any more comments? Hearing none, as a point of order, I forget to move uh, the minutes into the minutes from the last meeting. Can someone make a motion? The move. Second. I, I see Councilperson Thomas. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you all for all of your time, all of the work that you do on all of these issues. And I personally am going to come down to Unity and, and see what you do, take a tour um, in very short order. So I'll, I'll see you soon. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank um, you. Well, thank you. Can I move to Welcome. adjourn? Second. Anyone not in favor of adjourning? All right. <laughs> Everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Bye-bye.